I, my style is definitely not just sitting and reading for half an hour, so I've picked about seven different excerpts. I'll read a little bit. I'll introduce some of the men that I interviewed in the book, and we do have a live audience here for everybody tuning in virtually, so by all means, if you have any questions, just let me know, and uh, we'll also have a discussion later if you want. What I was intrigued about when I first started thinking about the why, why I was writing this book is exactly for this reason, you know, what is a real man? And I had a hard time answering that for myself, and I suspect that we all have different ideas of what this is. And even if you look at these two images, I mean, we have four dogs, I picked two of them. We have the bull mastiff on the one side, and then we have this little white loud Maltese on the other. Is there one that seems as though it is more manly than the other, perhaps? Because 10 years ago, there is no way, there is no way that I would have walked that little loud thing and actually felt secure with myself. And that's a big part of it. I spent a lot of my life being very insecure with myself. I had no relationship with myself. I turned to things outside of myself, um, you know, to, to mask some of the pain that I was in. And I realized that I had to look at some of my own perceptions of masculinity, and that's one of the key things that I was interested in when I interviewed the men. So I wanna start it off by just sharing a little piece around masculinity. And this, is, this excerpt was actually written by Tyson Williams, who I think is tuning in. So Tyson, thanks for this contribution. He's out of North Battleford, and he says this, my view of masculinity was a major factor that prevented me from reaching out for help during my struggles with mental illness. I thought real men were tough enough to solve their own problems and that they didn't ask for help. It was only after I was admitted to a mental health unit that I changed my perspective on masculinity. While having a cigarette outside the facility, a beast of a man walked up to me. Imagine the stereotypical image of a manly man, and that would be this guy. He stood at least six foot five, had a thick black beard, and his hands looked like they were bigger than my head. What are you in for, he boomed. Too scared to lie, I spoke the truth. I'm struggling with mental illness. His eyes immediately showed compassion, and he placed his hand on my shoulder. Yeah, man, me too. And there it was. Here is a man who represented the very essence of what I thought a real man was, and he struggled with mental illness. At that moment, I realized that it was my own perception of what a man was that needed to change because real men struggle too. And that's key because a lot of it is breaking down those barriers of what we might think to be a real man. This is Tyson Williams today, and his story is featured in the book. He actually reached out for help with Michael Landsberg. Some of you might know Michael Landsberg, the host of the TSN show Off the Record. And I mean, Tyson had picked his day to die. And he was just kind of waiting for something to go off in his mind to say, okay, time's up. And what happened is he turned on the TV and then it was Michael Landsberg interviewing Stefan Riche. And they're both talking about mental illness and Tyson had never seen two men talk about mental illness so openly. It was only maybe a four minute show, but after that aired, Tyson decides to fire an email to Landsberg and he says, man, that was cool. That was cool. I've never seen two men talk so openly about this stuff. That's gonna help a lot of people, but for me, it's too late, and then he sent it. And then he went back into his room, he kind of tested the rod that he had in place to see if it would hold him up, and then he heard a bing, indicating he got an email. And so he left the room and he, he checks, who is it? Landsberg. Michael Landsberg takes the time to send an email and he says, what's going on, man? What, what do you mean it's too late for you? And long story short, they exchange a handful of emails and eventually Landsberg says, if you don't at least try getting help, you'll never know. Suicide can always be on the back burner. And Tyson ended up making it through the night. He made it to see the sunrise. And he eventually did get the help that he needed. And it's fascinating to me because these two girls would not be here had that exchange not taken place. And, and so there's a couple of things. I mean, for one, there's that need you know, to, to reach out for help and it was received and the way that Michael supported him was simply by listening, encouraging him to get help, and those two girls are here because of it. And he also has an older daughter as well. 
And how he kind of summarized his experiences is Tyson said, I've learned that my depression does not define me. It's what I have, it's not who I am. To this day, my biggest dose of medicine is that I talk. And that's the only reason that I'm alive today. And I found, not only for my own experiences, but for all the men that I interviewed, that was the barrier, right? Trying to put a voice to pain. And I always feared doing that because of judgment, right? What will people think? Will it impact the workplace? All those things. And to this day, Tyson now uses his story to help motivate other people to find their voice. Then there's also this man, Murray Drew. Murray Drew lives here in Saskatoon, and he's a professor. His quote I found really interesting. He says, the only reason that I finally reached out for help was because my wife, her name was Bev, gave me the ultimatum, see a doctor or see yourself out the door. And initially, what do you think Murray chose? The door. The man spends three nights in a motel here in Saskatoon, and then finally he realizes, sucks. You know, I, I can't see my wife, I can't see my kids, but why is it that so many men have to go through that much struggle before they finally reach out or get through the doors to receive what they need? And he eventually got into the debate center. The, the neat thing about Murray is, talk about full circle, because when he went back to the U of S, he said, I'm done with the hiding. And he started to talk openly about his struggles with mental illness for not only his students, but also faculty. And, and this is really what the book is about. It's, it's like vulnerability breeds vulnerability. Because Murray was vulnerable, what did that do for everyone else? It gave them permission to be vulnerable. So all of a sudden now students are reaching out and talking about their pain. And that's the way I think that we can break a lot of this uh, stigma. And then we have Another fascinating man named Jay Blakely, whose story is featured also under the chapter of mental illness. And I just want to read you a little bit about his story. If I can find it. Jay recently became a father. And he says, our son will grow up knowing all about mental illness. Beth, the mother of their son, has depression, and I have bipolar. So the likelihood of Jack having a mental illness is pretty high. This sucks for him, but he's going to grow up in a family where we're going to catch it early. And he's, going to know that there, that, and he's going to know that if there's something wrong with him, he can talk to us because we're that kind of family. It's a common reaction for parents to tell their kids to stop crying when an emotional outburst happens. When I was growing up, my mother was very smart with me emotionally. If I started to cry about something, my mom would just pick me up and say, it's okay, Jay, just cry it out. She would then sit and cry with me until there were no more tears to cry. And to this day, if I see my mom cry, I completely lose it. But the positive side is that there's not an ounce of toxic masculinity in me that prevents me from being emotional. So Jack is being raised the same way, that it's okay to cry. And he talks about the stigma, because when it comes to mental illness, he says the stigma is not gone. It's, it still remains. And to get through to people, you have to get into their faces. And what you need often is activists on the corners. We need boots on the ground. During my time at the Dubai Center, I remember looking out the large windows towards the Mimwasan Trail. There are always runners traveling these paths. One man stopped in the middle of the trail, looked straight at me, and circled his right finger behind his, or beside his head, the crazy signal. And I was enraged, and I desperately wanted to get outside to fight that guy. He was the problem. He was the stigma. That was him. Stigma personified was this jackass on the trail. And then a few years later, Beth and him are now walking on the trail in front of the Dubai Center. And there was a man who was actually standing in the same window where Jay once was a few years earlier. I gave him two thumbs up, and he gave me a little wave. And I thought to myself, man, I wish I could just stand here all day and just give people the thumbs up. Obviously, I couldn't do that, but then I had a better idea. I would make a sign that says, you will get better. And I would stand there 
and hold up the sign. I quickly realized that I couldn't do that all day, so Beth and I made four different signs. First one was you matter. The second one was sick, not weak. The third one was you will get better. And the fourth one is the struggle is real. We joined forces with the sketch when Health Authority put up a giant billboard behind the hospital and slapped our signs up there. That's, that's pretty remarkable. I mean, not only did it come full circle for him, but that, that, that initiative was also supported by the Saskatchewan Health Authority. And in summary, Jay says that I've been hell and back, but now I can show people who are in hell that they can come back. I'm only going to be alive for so long. Martin Luther King spoke about the fierce urgency of now. That's the perfect way to put this activism. I don't know how long this universe is going to take it to call quits on me. I've often said that you are the author of your own life, but the universe is the editor. So write one hell of a story and don't end it too soon. Pretty powerful. It's pretty powerful. The man has also become very open and transparent about his struggles to this day, which in turn, of course, has helped other men come forward. And then it was important for me to dedicate an entire chapter to addiction because obviously there's a correlation between mental illness and addiction and every theme in the book is something that I've also personally struggled with. And addictions, I mean, I was a compulsive gambler, I was an alcoholic. Um, I think for me, the definition of addiction is just living outside of self so that we don't have to be with self. And that's where, I mean, I, I, I said this before, but I, I really did everything so I didn't ever have to go within. I didn't, I didn't know how to feel. I didn't want to feel. I didn't know how to put a voice to my pain. And there's this one man, his name is Brad Sorosky, who I interviewed. And he also had cancer. And he talks about the parallels between addiction and cancer and how he was treated. And here's what he says. Brad says, I have seen how people treat diseases differently. When I was going through addiction, people crossed the street to get away from me. I recall desperately needing a ride to detox, but I couldn't find anyone who wanted anything to do with me. When I was going through my cancer treatments, people wanted to get closer to me. They were quick to support me and would say, hey, if you ever need a ride to a doctor's office, call me. I can help you out with whatever you need. Whether I was battling addictions or cancer, he says I was still the same person suffering. Why was I ostracized for addiction, but loved and supported with cancer? And then in closing, Brad says, my experience speaks volumes to the stigma that still exists around drug and alcohol addictions. Education and understanding will reveal that we all deserve love and respect. Spot on, right? I mean, addictions, for me, it is natural to want to leave behind a life of pain, to leave behind a life of hell in exchange for pleasure, right? I mean, I, when I first drank alcohol, there was, you hear this often, right? Oh, I fell in love with it. Well, I did because for the first time I felt calm. You know, there was an escape. If someone has a reward or a positive experience from something, do they take it again? It's logical, right? And so it, it's like when, we, when we're in pain and we don't have the proper tools to manage the pain, we just grab at straws, and that's what I did. It wasn't a healthy way, but we do what we can with what we have. So one of the men who shared his story around his struggle with addictions and recovery is Chris Beaudry. Chris Beaudry, as some of you might know, was the former assistant coach of the Humboldt Broncos. And Chris Beaudry is the one who pulled up to the bus after that crash that claimed so many people's lives. And I cannot imagine what that was like for him the challenge for me writing this book was that every time that I had to interview them and then I had to kind of transcribe or write their story, then I have to kind of take that on and feel it and also relive my own stuff. And who the hell am I to edit someone's story? Because that's, I mean, that's sacred stuff, right? So it was difficult for me. But the, the part that I love about Chris's story, because he actually struggled with addictions prior to this crash, and Chris says, nobody's going to tap you on the forehead and release all your demons. It's you that must do the work. If you want to heal, look in the mirror. And that's hard. You know, I mean, I, I remember one time a counselor said, Al, I want you to look in the mirror and say, I love you. 
Nope. Nope. I, I can't do it because I had no connection with this. But I do remember saying, I like you. And that was hard enough. But exactly what Chris is saying, you know, we have to do the work. Healing is work. Time does not heal all wounds. Time provides us with the opportunity to heal. And I think that, you know, sometimes we're the victim, uh, as I was. You know, the woe is me. Nobody gets me. But eventually, all these men understood that if they wanted something different, they had to do something different. And then I also appreciate Eric Olawson. And he's in politics, and you know, in politics, you often have to wear a mask. But he is very open about his struggles with addictions. And this is spot on. He says, every morning, I wake up and thank God that I'm sober. He says, I wish every single person could have the feeling I experience when I open my eyes each day. It's this hope that drives me to be a better person and a strong leader. But again, he earned his freedom. Right? I mean, it's, it, recovery is, is, not, is not easy. It's, it's a process, not an event, but it's possible. And then I hummed and hawed, and I knew that I had to include this one. Because when it comes to men, we do not talk about sexual abuse, right? For me, my memory surfaced about eight years ago, and I started to recall being sexually abused throughout my childhood. Where do you go with that? As a man, where do you go with that pain? And, you know, there's, there's so many men who I meet who carry this with them and who don't know how to put a voice to it, and they suffer in silence. And so I found uh, a man named Niall, Niall Schofield, who I'll introduce to you right away. But I just want to share a little bit about this section um, on, on sexual abuse. While abuse is debilitating for any gender to endure, the stereotypes regarding masculinity create additional challenges for males. Men are taught to be strong, powerful, brave, independent, and in control. Being sexually abused strips each of these traits away, impacting their sense of manhood. Many believe that males should be strong enough to protect themselves from an assault. A sense of worthlessness is not fulfilling his gender role. Also accompanies the other symptoms of crippling fear, vulnerability, and powerlessness that go hand in hand with abuse. Even when the sexual abuse has ceased, the mental abuse continues as the victim has immense feelings of shame, worthlessness, and self-blame. The twisted reality is that perpetrators don't teach the victims to hate them, but rather to hate themselves. Sexual abuse impacts every aspect of a man's life. It can cause men to experience confusion about sexual orientation, difficulties with intimacy, failed relationships, and even challenges maintaining a career. Sex, power, control, love, and abuse are all mixed together in a dysfunctional web. Healthy norms might no longer be viewed as healthy and are anything but normal in the mind of a man who has been abused. Men who have endured these experiences are also at greater risk for mental health problems, including PTSD, depression, substance use disorders, and suicide. Go figure, right? I mean, especially if we cannot put a voice to this. And shame is the one thing that almost killed so many, so many men. I think it is the reason that we lose so many men to suicide. But the thing that I've learned, the thing that all of the men have learned is that the more that they put a voice to their shame, the freer they become, right? All this stuff cannot stay inside. That's where we run into trouble. That's where it's easy to turn to drugs, alcohol, gambling, whatever, sex, to make sure it's locked up. But then it's just a blanket over a deeper root cause. So I find Niall, because he, he actually lives in Warman, very open about his struggles with sexual abuse. And it's difficult to find men who are this vulnerable and transparent. And he goes through his story. What I love about Niall is that he said over several generations, the sickness of sexual abuse has trickled its way down the family tree. Silence is not the answer, and this sickness ends with me. 
I hope that my story can give strength to others so that they can find out who they truly are without fear. It's pretty powerful. Unfortunately, as I previously alluded to, this pain sometimes leads to suicide. And here in Saskatchewan, for example, we have the highest suicide rate out of all prairie provinces. Men were dying at a rate three to one greater than women. And a lot of it is because, you know, the, those stigmas that exist. And it's the men right now between the ages of 40 and 60 that have the highest suicide rates. And I think that it's because of some of those teachings that those kids grew up with at that time. So Peter Headley uh, is another man that I interviewed. And he says this, he says, the message boys often get for crying at physical or emotional pain is to repress their emotions and move forward or people will view them as weak, a coward, or a sissy. So many young males are being bullied to make them act more like real men. And in doing so, we inflict great harm to the way that they think about themselves and the world that they inhabit. Such mistreatment skews their views of masculinity and manhood without the ability or permission to show weakness and get help. Frustration often boils over into violence to themselves or others. We end up losing men in, emotion, in emotional turmoil to violence or in a rapidly increasing number of cases, death by suicide. And one of the men that I interviewed was Nathan Chamakis. Nathan Chamakis is from Pelican Lake by Chittick. And here's what he said. He says, I have embraced my past and now use my story to connect with others. I believe that it took that painful day of attempting suicide to connect with me with culture. And today, a large part of my purpose is to help others connect with their culture as well. So when Nathan was in grade 12, he went around the corner of his house and he tried to end his life by hanging himself. And after he had jumped off that limb of the tree, his two younger brothers actually came around the corner and cut him down. What I found interesting about this is as I'm interviewing him, you know, he says that to this day, they have never had a conversation about that day. Because that's gotta be pretty traumatic, right? For the younger brothers to have to witness their older brother and to try to, you know, save him. And I said, man, like this, this book, you know, it's going to be out there. And the, the interesting thing for me was that it was a catalyst to have conversations. And then Nathan was able to have this difficult conversation with his brothers. And then he had the difficult conversation with his parents, what it was like for them to have to see their son in the hospital. This is my point. And this is what the whole book was about. Done with the silence, done with the hiding, open conversations, because if we cannot have these conversations, I mean, the, the next generation, the next generation of boys are preparing and training to be men, right? If we can't model it, why the hell would they? And so for Nathan, culture, I just spit all over the place. Culture has become his pillar of wellness. And he taught me a lot. And he continues to teach others. And then there was this part in the book, which I, <laughs> I really, really struggled with. Because I lost my best friend, Justin Andres, to suicide. And uh, like that, that, that rocked my world. I was, um, I, I was actually working as an addictions counselor, you know, I'm trained in all this stuff and denial is a great place to live, isn't it? And I, yeah, it's, it was one of those times where I would say I was consumed by this loss. And in a twisted way, him dying by suicide saved my life because I, you know, I saw, I saw everything unfold. And I decided to interview Justin's father and that's Justin's father, Ed. And I cried the whole way to that interview because, you know, it's painful to, to to go back to that. But it was also healing um, for both of us to, to be able to just talk. And so in this story, Ed talks about 
what it's like as a father to lose a son to suicide. But again, it's talking, and, and there is hope after losing someone to suicide. And this is tough stuff, I mean, but again, it demands our attention. And then another individual who had lost someone to suicide was Landon. Landon actually lives in Rosetown, Landon Waite. He lost his sister to suicide. And he would have been, I think it was between the summer of grade 11 and 12 when this happened. And, and it was only a few days after the funeral that he had to go to school. And you know, he talks about how he could feel all the eyes on him. And, and it's interesting because he says, I didn't want my buddies at school to see me walk into the counselor's office. I thought it would affect my reputation of being strong. However, I quickly realized that I needed to take care of my own needs rather than worry about what anyone else thought of me. And so even at that age, he was able to kind of rewrite those scripts and he started to see a counselor frequently. And what did that do? It taught others, hey, you know, this is okay. And he was able to find some healing because he used his voice like all of the other men did. And that's really, you know, what I saw more than anything. I saw this, this bond, this brotherhood, this unity, people coming together uh, Simone McLeod, you know, uh, a friend of mine, she created this one for a different book that I had written, but it captures it perfectly, right? It's, it's like we, we, we have to come together for all of this. And uh, even last night, I did an event based on all the suicides that have been taking place in Medicine Hat. So they've had seven men die by suicide since I think it was uh, around May. And so a friend of mine, Mike Cameron, and I said, man, we gotta, you know, we got to do something about this. Like, I don't know what it looks like, but there's a beautiful organization called the Inner Man Project that started just over three weeks ago in Medicine Hat. And they were similar, right? Let's, let's get everyone together. Let's talk about this. And in three weeks, they had over 3,000 followers. What does that say? You know, there's a lot of people who are tired of being quiet, and they're starting to use their voice and come together. So if you ever have time, check out the Inner Man Project on Facebook. And you, you can just scroll down some of those posts, and it is so powerful for me to read because it's how often it starts off. I've never shared this before, but, you know, or it's the first time that they're being vulnerable. And what happens? They're not judged. They're met with love, compassion, right? And, and it's a beautiful transformation. And I am seeing this happen in communities all over Canada where more and more they're having circles, they're getting men together. Now it has to be virtually often, but the point is it's happening and it is great. There is a lot of pain. There are a lot of positives as well. Travis Williamson, from right here in Saskatoon, another one of these beautiful souls, he says, I recognized a need for a healthy environment where men could come together, learn, and share how to stop sending negative messages to ourselves and others. I wanted to show men that vulnerability is not a weakness, but rather a strength. The man opened up his own doors to have support groups for men. I mean, that's pretty cool. Maybe not a healthy boundary. Uh, <laughs> no, his intent was pure, and it's the same thing. I mean, I have held talking circles with up to 60 men, and I see the fear, but as soon as one person becomes vul vulnerable, right, you just watch, and it's infectious because nobody wants to lead a life of pain. Nobody wants to lead a life in the darkness, right? We all want to be free from it. The problem is we don't always know how to get there. And I'm saying all my experiences have shown me that the way to get there is to take a risk, is to be vulnerable, and often the results are not what we thought up here, right? Because there's a lot of people who are ready to just welcome it. And those who aren't, ignorance is just lack of, lack of information. So then I, I was also intrigued because I wanted to figure out how, how do people support men? Because, I mean, often, right, how are you doing? Good. Or maybe if they say, how are you doing, we'll say, okay. And okay is sometimes code for not good, but we're not always the best communicators. And I, I interviewed two women 
Uh, the first one was Elena Gilmet, and she actually created a mental health course online, which talk about the time. The time is now for this too. And she talked about her husband in her story, Brian, who suffers from OCD. And we have both learned the value of talking to each other about how we are really feeling and the importance of being honest. And then she closes with something that I love. She says, I now value, or sorry, I now understand the value of self-care. Because when you try to support someone with an addiction, when you try to support someone with a mental illness, that's a different beast. And I see this, you know, in my relationship with my wife, because when I go down, ah, it, you know, I see the way it affects her. I see the way it affects the kids. And um, that need, no matter what, no matter if we're on either side, we've got to start taking care of this. And Leslie, Leslie is uh, Matt's wife and they are actually out of Watrous. Leslie was one of the co-founders for the Do More Egg, a great resource. And Leslie says, sometimes it was as simple as giving my husband, Matt, a hug and telling him that everything was going to be okay. I would let him know that I was by his side and reassure him that we would get through this together. And I find, I get a lot of questions about how do we support the men in our life? What did, what did you want? You know, when, when you're in pain, what do you want? I didn't want to be fixed. I think sometimes we even try to fix others. It doesn't work. I, I realized in interviewing all the men, we all want the same thing. We want to be seen. We want to be heard. And ultimately, we want to be supported in some way. And it's different for all of us. But it also comes down to, you know, elders. El elders always say, we have two ears and one mouth for a reason. And, and I think that we all just want to be you know, heard. And so if somebody starts to share, zip and, and allow them to just get some of that darkness out. And for me, <laughs> that's, that's what I got today, which is um, mind blowing. I would not be here without Tanya. And, you know, I don't want to get into my story, but uh, at one point, you know, I'm given a month to live if I don't change what I'm doing. And um, it's, it's crazy for me to think about where I was and where I am today. And I, I still find life really, really hard. But the difference is that I have supports around me. I know how to act on them. And I have people in my life like Tanya who really, you know, help me to open up those doors, to make the call, to get the help, because I don't always you know, feel like it or want it, um, but I've learned, as all these men have, sometimes we've got to get rid of all of the, I don't like negative people, but get rid of the unhealthy people, right, so that we can surround ourselves with people who lift us up, and, and that's what all of them have done, and somehow, you know, I was able to find Tanya. And, and so when this book was launched, Tanya and I just wanted to honor the men in some way, so as many of them as we could, we got them together and, and we you know, gave them a book, gave them a, a limited print from Simone. And what I've learned is with all the stigma, the best way to remove the stigma is by sharing your story, hands down. Hands down, we all have a story. There's nothing more powerful. I would say there's nothing more sacred than your story and, and I hope that in some way you can, you can put a voice to yours because I can guarantee you someone needs to hear it as much as your soul probably needs to say it. And, and in closing, I'm just gonna read two paragraphs which kind of for me wraps it all up. I wrote, I've always believed that our voice is our greatest tool, but the voices of too many men are being suffocated by the messages of yesterday's society regarding masculinity. These men have chosen to hang on to these messages and believe them for too many years. They have chosen to sacrifice their wellness in an effort to maintain the image of what society says they should be. The relationship between men and mental health has often been called a silent crisis. Today, we are breaking the silence. Today, we are the ones who will redefine what it means to be a man. The time to talk is now. That's it. That's it.
Thank you, thank you.